Welcome everyone, this is John from PacketWrite. Uh, today we want to walk through setting up our client natively on Windows. It's been some time since we've published a video on our YouTube channel, so I want to thank everybody uh, who's been patient. Uh, we've received several requests uh, in the comments of our old videos about walking through setting up PacketWrite on Windows, and so we're looking forward to doing that. Um, we're going to follow our quick start, so if you want to follow along, most of the steps are going to be captured in uh, our quick start. So if you just visit docs.packetride.com, visit the quick start section, um, you'll have some text here that you can follow along. Uh, the very first thing that you wanna do is download uh, the latest version of our Windows client. And so you can see we support uh, 32 and 64 bit. Um, and so just in case, if you're running um, Windows XP, we've got you covered. And uh, so uh, please download the latest version of the client and I'll show you a trick that I do when I'm uh, installing our client on Windows. I'll, uh, I'll unpack our tarball right here, or rather zip file. And what I like to do is I like to put all the, all the applications and programs that I install on Windows, but um, ones that don't have like a Windows installer. Uh, I typically tend to create a directory within my user's directory called bin, and this is just uh, convention I'm following from Linux and Unix because I use I use that environment quite a bit and so uh, I copy the file here and then I set up an environment variable so I sort of did that very quickly but if you go to the start menu you just type in environment and click on this um, control panel setting you'll you'll get this system properties um, application that pops up and you can click on environment variables and then click on um, the path variable for your user. And you'll see that I have already added this here, but you could do the same. And what that will do is it will, it will make it more convenient for you to run um, our client and then also any other programs that you wanna use this convention for. It just makes it much more convenient. Um, you'll be able to run them really um, in any location where um, any, any current working directory that you might be in um, if you've got PowerShell or Command Prompt open. And so uh, the first thing I'll do is just print the version of our tunnel out. Um, and what I'll do next is I'll uh, just visit, you know, our, um, our, uh, our dashboard, so our account as we logged in. And we currently don't have any, any tunnels. So what I'll do is I'll configure my first tunnel. Uh, and what I'll do is um, it'll prompt us with a path for where we want to store a configuration file. And so on Windows, we really only have one default path that we can use. So we'll just, we'll work and um, we'll select that one. And we'll use the same credentials that we use to log into our uh, packet ride account. And you'll see this one message here that says, um, you know, effectively, if you created your packet ride account using your Google account, then you really want to run configure with dash dash URL. Um, it'll generate a dynamic URL for you. You just plug it into your web browser and follow it. And all you need to do is um, log in, and you'll have to do that twice. It's just uh, one method to first log you in, and then another method to just kind of re-verify you that um, that your account is um, is truly yours. And then the client will pick that up and then just automatically continue um, through the configuration process. And so, um, and so at this point, you know you want to choose a region. And so typically, um, if you're trying to self-host. Uh, you're more than likely interested in network performance. So you want to pick a region that's close to you, but there might be other regions that you're interested in, um, you know, for some other reason or purpose. And then after you choose your region, you'll see that uh, some information about your tunnel is printed out. So this is the host name that's assigned to it. It's um, it's persistent. It doesn't change. It, it It's very useful, um, you know, if you want to be able to to share the URL to like others. Or if you want to be able to build some programs that use this URL or tests, um, you know, some part of another application using this URL, and so like a webhook is a very good example of that. Um, it's it's very convenient. Um, having a persistent URL is very convenient for a lot of different reasons. You'll see that when we visit our um, our, our dashboard here on packetride.com, that the same information is, is is provided. So the very first thing that that you want to do is just test that your tunnel is working correctly. And so what we'll do here is we'll just copy that 
and visit it in our browser. And this is pretty much just like our Hello World, um, our Hello World screen for our tunnel. We pretty much just ger generate um, this page when you don't have any rules um, set up for your tunnel. And so this 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 demonstrates here um, that that there's nothing on our computer, on our network, on our firewall that's preventing our tunnel from uh, functioning correctly. So this is a really good first step for you to run the very first time you uh, you set up a tunnel. Um, one thing I want to also show is um, the directory that our packet write configuration is in. So you can see here it's in .packet write, and if I just um, show you right now what our configuration file looks like. It's it's mostly just printing out some of the key information that your tunnel uses to authenticate with our servers, and then also uh, the host, the server host you connect to, and then of course the tunnel, um, the hostname for the tunnel that you have. Now, it, it's recommended that you never, really ever, modify this file by hand. If you do, um, you may you may mess something up, and then your tunnel may not work, and um, you may have to just go about shutting it down and starting from scratch. So, um, so yeah, please just use the command line um, for making any modifications. Um, if you type in the packet ride info subcommand, you'll see that this information will be printed out each and every time uh, you run it. So let's walk through some examples. Um, so what I've done is I've set a Plex on this computer, and Plex listens on port 32400. And so what I want to do is show an example that um, uh, that you'll find. There's a very popular tool in Grok that's used for creating tunnels. It's very much developer focused, um, and so uh, and so it uses this sort of convention, this this command convention. And so we'll go about running it. And this is one of our instant traffic hosting rules. Basically, it's a rule that can. Um, request and route some traffic dynamically, but it's not saved to our configuration file. So this is great for um, just, you know, hosting something um, in a one-shot type of feature, um, and it doesn't um, it doesn't get saved, and so you can point it to, to different servers each and every time, and, um, and it works. It's very convenient. And so if I just refresh this tab where previously our sort of hello screen was being loaded, you'll now see that uh, that now we're, we're hosting a Plex here. And so um, this kind of demonstrates um, just how simple it is. Uh, now, you know, Plex is something that, you know, you will be hosting persistently. Um, and so, you know, Packet Ride is a tool that makes it uh, easy and convenient to reliably uh, self-host with a tunnel, but we don't want to have to type in our rules each and every single time. And so that's where our tunnel subcommand comes in. It, it has two subcommands, HTTP and TCP, and we use these for creating and managing, um, you know, traffic rules in those two categories. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new rule, and this will be a persistent rule, and it'll use the host name that was assigned to my tunnel, which is um, it doesn't change, so it's really convenient, and I can bookmark it, and um, Plex. Um, the, the Plex software actually listens on port 32400. It actually listens um, for HTTP and also for HTTP requests. And so, um, and so because the, 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 the client is going to be requesting HTTPS traffic, it's going to terminate that HTTPS traffic and then send plain text to this port. And that's going to be important in the next exercise we do where we're going to use um, the TCP forwarding features of, um, of the client. So um, I'll add that, and I'll just use the info command. It'll print out all of my rules. And then I'll go back to my config file, and you'll see that this block was added to it and that it you know, captures all of the commands that I, I passed to, um, to this command right here. So what I'll do next is I'll just run start. And basically, I'll just refresh my page here and you'll basically see that the same page gets loaded, which is ideal. That's what we want. And now every time we run start, um, that'll that'll be the case. And so I'll just let this page finish loading, um, and you can kind of see that it has. And I only have just a little bit of music that I added to my Plex here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just um, gracefully kill um, the client. 
Now, one thing, one thing to make a note, which I think a lot of users stumble on um, when they're when they're new to uh, Packerwrite, is that they'll try to sometimes add rules and uh, and then access them in their browser or whatever application client they're using, um, and the and and they won't see those requests be served. And so, with with the client and our configuration, um, it's not it's not dynamic. It won't pick up changes to your configuration and then be reflected dynamically. You'll always have to gracefully kill your client and then add the rules or add the rules in another window and then restart it basically. So what I want to do next is I want to use the our, our sort of shorthand instant TCP traffic command and then forward traffic over just a generic TCP port um, to my local host listening at 32400. So a couple things happens here. First, um, we're allocated a port, uh, 22841, uh, and then it also creates this sort of temporary rule. And then you'll, you'll see one change here, which is that um, our port was allocated and it was added to our list, but there's no destination and destination port that was added. Um, anytime a port is allocated, it's, it's always going to be added to this list, but um, because we want to reuse it and because it's persistent. And so, um, and now I Let's, let's see it working in action. So I had mentioned earlier that um, Plex is interesting because on the same port, it'll serve HTTP plain text traffic, but then also HTTPS, which is um, encrypted traffic. And so Plex generates its own certificate, it's self-signed. And so when we reload this page, we're going to get, um, oh, hold on here. I uh, used the wrong port. There we go. And so you see here that um, the page is loaded, but we actually get this, um, this sort of uh, security risk. And this is, this is because um, it's a self-signed certificate that's being used by the Plex server. So it's, it's, it's actually pretty clever that it can serve both types of traffic on the same port. Um, and so this is our server. So we're gonna kind of uh, continue along, but this just sort of demonstrates that um, uh, uh, the ability to, uh, you know, uh, use the um, the TCP subcommand to create um, an instant traffic rule and then divert just generic TCP traffic, which can really be any kind of TCP traffic to some destination application that you're that you're running locally here. Um, and so that loads fine. Um, another use case that this is used quite often for is for just being able to throw up a tunnel real quick, um, you know, so somebody can connect over SSH. So this is going to basically just, um, if we were on a Linux or a Unix system, it would it would forward to our local SSH server. Uh, we don't have one running here, but but now we can actually use this port with our SSH client, and it'll connect to our locally running SSH port. Um, but um, but on this system, that's that's not a service that we're running here. Um, what I'll do is I'll just kind of refresh the config here. So so that still hasn't changed, but um, I want to make this a permanent rule as well. And so I will use this command. And the first thing I need to do is specify the port. Um, so I specify a port that was allocated to my tunnel. And kind of similar to the HTTP traffic rule, um, you know, we want to uh, specify a destination and a destination port. TCP is much more simple. With HTTP, you can um, you could throw up a, um, a password portal in front of any web service, you can set up Let's Encrypt, um, you can rewrite the host header. There's a lot of different options with an HTTP traffic rule. Uh, okay, and so what I'll do is I'll use the info command to print out all my rules. So I have an HTTP and a TCP rule as well. And now I just refreshed my file here and you'll see that now my rule's been saved. So I can just run start one more time and I'll just restart the page. Uh, I'm not really expecting many surprises here. Um, the one last thing that I'm going to uh, do, the last exercise, is I'd like to show everyone just really quickly how we can run the client as a service in Windows. Um, and, so, and so right now what we've done is we've set up um, some rules. Now we want to set up a service and so uh, if you use the Windows sub command and install. Um, so we, we actually have to run this as an admin because we're going to be setting up a 
um, a window service. And so what I'll do is I'll just right click here. Actually, what I'll do is let me just run PowerShell here as an admin. All right. Okay, and so you can see I'm running it as an admin and it's actually very small right now, the, the text. Let me just expand that a bit. All right, it was probably more readable. Um, and so what I have here is um, PowerShell running as an admin and I want to install um, the Windows service, right? So like right now, my, my tunnel's not running uh, but I have Plex running 24-7 in the background, maybe some other applications. And so I want to use my Windows native client to, um, to, uh, to basically start the tunnel on boot and then to serve all these other applications that are running um, on my host. And so uh, let's see here. Um, I just ran Packerite Windows install. Uh, this, this is running as an admin in PowerShell, and it just prints out that, uh, that the service has been installed. And so inside start, just type in services. And then um, this is also an app that requires some extra privilege. So run that as an admin as well. And so you can see here that um, I can't blow it up, but this is basically the packet write service. And so it's not running right now. So I'll just click start. And so we'll, uh, we'll kind of take this and maybe we'll Close the tab and we'll try a different browser just to make sure we're not using the cache. And yeah, and so this is loading. We'll just accept and continue. And so now you can see um, the, the packet write client is running in the background. It's being managed as a Windows service. Um, and so and so yeah, everything is um, is working. Um, you know, as, as one would hope if um, they were setting up a service in Windows. And so uh, what we'll do is, um, one thing I'll highlight actually before we end the video is that uh, I'll just touch base again on um, setting up rules. When, when you are running a Windows service, it's, it's very much like running Packerite in another window that's just sort of out of sight, out of mind. Um, and so if you change rules, you'll want to go back to services. Let's just launch this one more time, you'll want to go back to services and restart it. And so you could just use this button right here. And so uh, that that concludes uh, this demo of using our client on Windows. We, we tried a few different exercises using uh, instant rules, persistent rules, HTTP traffic, TCP traffic, and some other videos will cover um, setting up some custom domains. And so um, we're going to work hard and try to get some more videos out. Um, we use Docker quite a bit in our tutorials, and so if you follow our tutorials um, on our on our website, um, we use Docker quite a bit. It's a really great way of deploying applications. It's also a great way of isolating applications, and so um, you know, being as security conscious as we can be these days, um, you know, having more layers is, um, is is generally a good way of of trying to isolate and and secure parts of your system, and so. Um, if you're interested in what kind of applications that you can host, um, uh, I use Linux Server uh, .io. It's a it's a website that's maintained by a lot of volunteers. Um, they're they they as they as a community and group are very much focused and interested in like self hosting different kinds of applications. So like applications like um, like Plex, um, Sonar, Lidar. Um, you know, Git, Git servers like Gitee, GitLab, um, different kinds of Kanban applications. Um, there's just there's just so many different services that you can self-host these days. Um, so LinuxServer.io is just a great resource for that. And so I um, want to thank everybody. Um, we'll be trying to post more content um, over the next couple of weeks. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Bye.